Tara. Hi, Tara. Hi. So tell us more about what's happening and what has happened and what is going to happen in the control room of LHCB. <laughs> Well, as you can see, it's very, very quiet now. It's quite a difference to when we first declared stable beams about an hour ago, because what's happened is, as you've just said, everyone has gone back for their lunch now. The excitement's over. We're taking data. We have, um, well, 100,000 events, maybe a couple of hundred thousand events now. Looks smooth. The backgrounds look really good. The running looks really good. And we're all relaxing. I have to say, it's been quite stressful. As a physicist yourself, what is your best hope for the performance of the LHCB detector in the next uh, couple of years? <laughs> oh, gosh, well, that's a big, a big thing. I mean, obviously, I'm hoping that we find discoveries of any description at all. Um, and in my own experiment here, LHCB, what, what I hope we find is some more indication as to the, the nature of antimatter, this really elusive, mysterious stuff that we don't know very much about, but which is responsible for the whole universe looking the way it does to us. And we don't know very much about it, and we've built this experiment to try and find out more about it and why it behaves differently to normal matter. And we don't know. It's one of the biggest mysteries we have in understanding the universe today. And it's one that we hope our experiment is going to help us crack. So that's a good one, too. One thing I noticed is that uh, your spokesperson at the moment uh, is from Russia. And the person who contributed most to the theory of uh, B physics, uh, uh, providing some keys to understanding antimatter, uh, was also Russian. It was Andrei Sakharov. <laughs> yes, that's right. Um, Sakharov realized that um, this notion of well, what's called CP violation, but what that means is just that there needs to be a slight difference in the behavior of matter and antimatter that that was absolutely fundamental in letting the universe evolve from the Big Bang, which is how we th think it all started, to how it is today. So yeah, maybe there's a Russian theme going on here. <laughs> Russians must have a gene which is especially good at antimatter and <laughs> CB violation. So if there wasn't this asymmetry, as far as I understand, we wouldn't be here. We would be just radiation. Yes, if we weren't... What, what happened in the very early universe was we think that in the Big Bang we had equal amounts of matter and antimatter that were created. And as soon as these met each other, then they annihilated together. And these annihilations made photons of light that then gave us new matter-antimatter particle pairs. And this battle played out whilst the universe expanded in its first minute of existence. But of course, when the universe expands, it cools down as well. And as it cools down, these annihilations lose their energy and they at some stage, and this was after a minute, when the universe was a minute old, no longer had enough energy to make more matter-antimatter particle pairs. And if the amount of matter and antimatter were equal at that time, then everything would have annihilated. The universe would be full of photons of light. We wouldn't exist, there would be no stars, and no galaxies, everything would be completely different. The fact that we do exist comes down to the fact that when the universe was a minute old, there was a tiny difference in the amount of matter and antimatter present there. I mean, really, really tiny, no more than one part in a billion, but it's that tiny difference which is key to letting us exist. Now, that tiny difference can only come about if matter and antimatter behave somehow slightly differently. And it's that slight difference in behavior that we don't understand. And that's what we're trying to understand with LHCB, because, after all, it is the reason why we're here in the universe to ask the question. And how does the beauty particle come into the scene? Ah, well, the beauty particle is the way that we tackle the question, because it just so happens, and we have no idea why, the effects of matter and antimatter are most different in the beauty quark system. So if we can study matter beauty quarks and antimatter beauty quarks, then the difference between their behavior is the most. It's the most easily observable. And in addition, beauty quarks have a very handy experimental signature. They travel for about a centimeter or so through our detector before they decay to other particles that we do reconstruct. And if we build really precise particle detectors, which we have done, really, really good ones, then we can actually detect the point at which these decay compared to the point at which they're produced. And experimentally, it's easy to identify them. So we pick the beauty quark, firstly, because it's, it's relatively easy to find. There are many of them, but also because it's our it's our best laboratory for studying antimatter that we have. And that's, that's the vehicle, if you like, that's going to allow us to understand antimatter better. This is fascinating, not only for the vocabulary, beauty, annihilation, radiation, but uh, especially for the implications uh, and uh, the explanations it's going to provide to one of the most uh, puzzling mysteries uh, of, of physics nowadays. But is the LHCB also contributing to the search for uh, 
more, let's say, not ordinary particles, because I couldn't call the Higgs ordinary particle, but uh, more known particles like the Higgs boson, which seems to be the most puzzling mystery of all at the moment, or for supersymmetry, and all the other searches that uh, the ATLAS and CMS detectors are specializing in. Are you also contributing to that kind of physics research? Well, we, we can do, because all the same interactions that go on inside ATLAS and CMS also go on in the collision point of LHCB. What's different about us is the shape of our experiment and where we're best at making measurements. So although we haven't done as much towards looking for Higgs and supersymmetry directly, we stand a much better chance of looking for supersymmetric signals indirectly through the way they influence other pr um, processes that we do measure and can measure precisely. So that allows us to have a completely different way of looking for supersymmetry and looking for this evidence of dark matter that supersymmetry can give us through the influence on known processes. And in fact, this gives us a much better reach than looking for it directly. So yes, we, we can contribute. We do it in a different and complementary way, and we will be doing it. That's another exciting part of our physics program. Thank you very much, Tara, for this fantastic voyage into the new territory that the LHC just opened up, providing collisions with 7 tera electron volt since now more than an hour or so, more than two hours of stable beams, I yes. read, yeah. on the yes. control line. <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> yeah, and it should, it should last quite a few hours longer.